Hi, everyone. We are going to get rolling here in just a second since it is 1045. Um, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, Dan Hubbard. He's a third year at TCOM, and I've been lucky enough to work with Dan for two years now on both the EMIG exec team at my school and then now on the TSEP Medical School Committee. Um, every time I come up with a wild idea to serve students, he's always the first person to step up to make it happen. He's one of the smartest, most dedicated and humble people who always drops everything to help out his fellow classmates and future physicians. For a while, students at TCOM even thought he was faculty because of his hands-on approach to education. This is something I've said entirely too many times over the past two years, but I'll never get tired of hearing it. Take it away, Dan. Thank you, Blake. That was uh, the nicest introduction I could receive. So today I'm going to be talking about simulation uh, rather than anything too emergency medicine specific. As you sure, as I'm sure you noted from Blake's introduction, I am the least experienced speaker at the conference for emergency medicine. So I'm not going to attempt to step on any toes. However, I have a real passion for simulation and medical education. Uh, through simulation especially. So I wanted to share that with you today. Uh, I'm basically going to be presenting two talks. Uh, the long one is going to be on ways I think we can all improve our simulation at any level, whether you're a medical student, a resident, or a future resident, as many of you are right now. And as Dr. Sontag noted this morning, I'm going to talk about sharing my screen here, the same as anyone else. Let me get the chat opened up. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box. All right. Um, and somebody will have to read those to me because I can't seem, I think it's behind my PowerPoint slides. But so today I want to talk about medical simulation and I'm going to present this as lessons from the fire ground. So prior to medical school, I was a firefighter EMT with Durango Fire Rescue in Durango, Colorado. And we were an all hazards department doing everything from wildland, hazmat, ice rescue, technical rescue, structural firefighting. And it seems kind of a strange way to talk about medical simulation. However, I think the fire department is really the best example of effective simulation that I've ever seen in my life. These uh, men and women, they train every day, they use simulation in all their trainings, and they do it well. And I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. And so this is uh, the 416 fire, I believe, in Durango. If you look down there behind the buildings, you'll see a line of firefighters. I believe they actually set this portion of fire to burn back up the hill and prevent the larger fire from coming down onto this house. So. Uh, I'll share a couple photos of myself uh, to embarrass myself just a little bit. This was back when I was uh, a little bit younger and fitter. And this photo on the left is one of our technical rescues. This is a gentleman, uh, this is a publicly published photo, so uh, it's kosher. This is a gentleman who crashed his bike and had penetrating trauma. And so this is on our way down the trail to the helicopter that is waiting in the valley to fly him to a surgeon. And then on the right, that is a photo of my first structure fire that I got to do anything on. So little rookie me there trying to figure out, you know, what I'm doing and freaking out, I'm sure at the time, but luckily you can't see it under the mask. And so faking it till you make it has been huge for me all along. And part of this presentation, I'm gonna share a few things that I think we can do better that I personally also can do better at. I believe in sharing our mistakes in education so that others can learn from them. And so the first one here is if you look in that left photo, you know, I, at one point I wore uh, white sunglasses. So, you know, we'll start off with that one and then I'll share a few others that maybe are more meaningful. All right, so in the fire department, as I said, I think they are the best example of effective repetitive simulation. There are big believers in practicing how you play. You, I'm sure any athletes in the room have heard this same thing. 
as far as when you train, the best way to train is to make it as realistic as possible so that you can get all the little details as well as that bigger picture as you're learning. Um, you know, that's the problem with didactic learning and lectures is that it can give you one thing, but when you, you know, go to the lecture on a chest tube and then you walk into the emergency department, they don't always equate to the ability to perform a chest tube after listening to that lecture on chest tubes. There is loss in that intangible aspect. And so on the left here, uh, this is a task trainer for the fire department. It looks a little bigger than our task trainers. So instead of a central line or something like that, uh, this is a prop that is simulating a roof. And so every once in a while we have to cut into a roof to ventilate or look for fire extension into that space. And so these two firefighters on the left are using that ladder to stabilize themselves on the roof. You'll look at the lower firefighter. Uh, he has his hand on an ax over there, which gives a foothold to the upper firefighter that allows him to cut through that roof. And so everybody has their little task to play in this training. And then the other thing you'll note is that both these firefighters participating in the training are fully dressed up. Nothing's on fire here. This is actually at parking lot level. The captain in the red helmet, he's not standing on a roof. He's standing directly on the parking lot. This is all just a giant prop. Um, but these firefighters, they wear their gear so that they're used to the feeling of the gear and the other aspects of that training while performing that skill. And so when it comes time to perform that skill or do that task or have that little bit of knowledge, those other you know, environmental factors aren't going to influence them. They're not going to throw them off when they need to perform that in a real scenario. And so that's a big part of simulation is that, you know, this is the reason we do it. We do it to improve our process, our means in that intangible realm. You can read a book all day, but when it comes time to practice, I don't think there's any better thing than simulation. Uh, this photo on the right is. Sorry if I look up here, it's my second monitor so I can see what y'all are looking at. Um, the photo on the right is actually another photo of me. This is during one of our technical rescue trainings. So Durango, Colorado has a diverse environment, including this is Cascade Creek above us. This is a 50 to 100 foot cliff above a uh, river that goes through the canyon bottom. And so we'll have ice climbers in the winter and we'll have kayakers in the summer and swimmers they jump through the pools and every once in a while, somebody makes a bad jump, somebody makes a mistake ice climbing and someone has to go get them. And so we try to train as well in all of the environmental conditions that we would uh, making a rescue. All right, so this is my first simulation lab. This is where I fell in love with simulation and really think, um, you know, obviously, as I said, I think it's the best. This is a burn tower. This is a large metal and concrete building where we can set uh, simulated, well, not simulated, real fires inside. And we can move the walls. We can set up as an apartment, a storage building, a shed. And so we can train our firefighters for the full deal. And this is a concept I'm going to bring up here a little bit because the burn tower is a little different than those task trainers, right? And so this is in medical simulation, we look at this as I'm sure you've all done a little simulation, hopefully. And I know if you're gonna be an emergency resident, you will do simulation. Uh, I don't think there's a program in the country that doesn't have some aspect of simulation in their EM program. And so for you either now or soon to be in your careers, this is a, a good place to start on there's different types of simulation as far as whether we're doing a test trainer, whether we're doing the whole patient case. When you're in the room running the mega code, have that big bad thing, you know, simulating the patient with ARDS that's intubated, that you're trying to do this, that, and the other, that's a very complex scenario. And we're looking at the real process and teamwork as far as getting through that complexity. But there's also the smaller aspects, those task trainers, those simpler cases, when we're looking at you know, a central line or, okay, let's work on diagnosing pediatric DKA today rather than 
let's work through an entire case and all the possibilities and the atypical presentations of pediatric DKA. And so I encourage you to think of simulation as it doesn't always have to be the full meal deal, the big, you know, burn tower presentation of trial by fire, fire for your students. This can be something that's smaller. It can be a specific objective that you want your learner to grasp and that you communicate well rather than gets lost in the noise of the burn tower. All right. And so that brings me to my first big point, uh, one of two today for this, is that objectives matter. And setting objectives in medical simulation is something that we always put on the sheet. They're at the top of every case you've ever run. And I'm sure any moderator that you've ever worked with has these objectives in their head. However, I argue that we can be better at our objectives. We can set more effective objectives. And I could go on for much longer than an hour on how to set those objectives. But I want to focus on a specific aspect of those objectives. And that's setting objectives to your learner. And I'm going to use this uh, photo on the left. This is of a propane tree. And it's called that because it's a giant iron tree with holes drilled in it. And it's cooked up to a propane line you'll see there at the bottom uh, that goes into that manhole. And we flush propane through it. We light it with a torch. And it shoots flames uh, about 20 to 30 feet in the air depending on what you're doing with it. And so this is to simulate a propane tank and somewhere along the line coming out of that propane tank, there's been a break and that break has ignited, right? So that gas is pressurized, pouring out of a tube as a plume of fire. Um, this specifically would put this fire close to the shutoff valve and in areas that aren't a big city like Houston or Fort Worth or out Austin or New York or wherever y'all might be, a lot of people have propane tanks in their yards. These propane tanks can be hundreds of gallons. It's a huge threat to houses and firefighters and people. And so we have to put these out. However, the issue on propane is that you can't spray a bunch of water on this tree and have it go out because you still have the issue of the propane and that propane will drop it's a little bit heavier than air and it'll create a big explosive cloud. So the goal is to turn off the propane, not to, you know, turn off, uh, not to just extinguish the fire. And so that, you know, if you're looking at how to set a specific objective, the propane tree is a nice example because it has one of, you need to turn off that valve, right? Singular objective, that's what we're going for. And so this is how we do it. There's two lines of firefighters. Um, they both have a hose in this picture, and I hope this is large enough for everyone to see. Um, and they use these hoses and they put them on what's called a fog stream. It's basically just a big cone of water, right? Just like when you're gardening and you put it on shower or cone or such. And you use this to push all the heat and the flames away from you. As I said, you don't want to put out the fire, but you want to protect your team. And so on these two lines of firefighters, you'll see most of them wearing black helmets. Uh, there's a guy towards the left that's wearing a green helmet. And then if you look in the middle at the front of the line, there's uh, one individual wearing a yellow helmet. And so that is your team leader. And so as you advance towards that propane tree, all of your men, will, men and women will kneel down and they'll protect. And if you see the individual uh, down here, I think you can see my cursor. He's reaching under, being protected by both of those hose lines to turn off that valve, right? And this is how we create a safety for ourselves. And, and so it seems like a strange example to bring up for medical simulation, but I'll, I'll make it work, I promise. So what I'm going to use this for is we're going to set the objectives to the level of our learner. And the first thing we're going to do, we're going to come back to this picture, right? So same scenario, uh, same firefighter, same picture. And this one I've identified with the arrow here, the big green arrow, the guy in the green helmet, that's the rookie member of this fire team, right? He's the guy that knows the least. He may be the, you know, uh, someone uh, 
Uh, she may be wearing her firefighting gear for the first time. This may be their first live fire training, uh, something like that. And so this is the member that needs the most support towards this goal. And so when we talk about setting objectives to the level of our learners, uh, we use a concept in medical, or, well, not medical education, education in general, it's called cognitive load, right? And so we have an intrinsic load and an extrinsic load, and then something called germane load. And so intrinsic load is what's happening both physically and mentally to you to accomplish that task. Extrinsic load is all of the environmental factors, the other that's distracting you from that task. And germane load is a little bit of a nebulous concept, but it's basically what's left over to put that short-term memory into long-term memory, right? That takes a little from us too. And so I like to think of that as a triangle. You're trying to make all the sides the same, right? You want appropriate intrinsic loads, appropriate extrinsic loads, and appropriate you know, learning happening on that germane load. So when we think about our rookie members, whether that be our medical students or our interns, we you know, should think about the concept that their intrinsic load, how difficult a task is for them, is gonna be super high, right? Doing anything as a first, for the first time is hard just getting started, just putting your foot in the door. You know, think about, uh, I think one of our program directors always says this at the PD panel, and I'm sure they will again. First person in the room whose pulse you should check is your own, right? And that's the same thing. And so the first time that someone asks you to do a procedure on your rotation or something like that, and you check your own pulse, I promise it's going to skyrocket just from your intrinsic load on having to perform that task and being reviewed, and it's not in the safe place that you practiced it in before, right? So, sorry about that. And for this, we need to alleviate everything else that we can for that learner. We want to make sure that the extrinsic factors, the distractions, the things we see in competitions that amuse and make us laugh, the dinosaur suits and the, and the hysteric patients and that kind of thing aren't useful to this first time learner. We want to make this simulation easy for them so they can accomplish their goal, so that they can really establish that good amount of learning. Right. And so that brings me to, you know, avoiding dilution. Don't dilute your objectives for each of your learners. For that new learner, like I talked about, having that hysterical patient in your pediatric DKA case makes it a simulation more about counseling a hysteric parent than it does about can this you know ms1 or intern or whoever properly diagnose and go through the process of testing and ordering the right labs and making sure the right consults and medications get used for this patient right and so when we set our objectives i think too much we set them on I'm gonna make this fun, I'm gonna make this complicated. I want them to really struggle with this and we make it a trial by fire. But I think learning can be better accomplished if we really try to keep it to our learners. Now, this is completely different than competitions. I still think we should all be in dinosaur suits and there should be hysteric patients and, and fun surprises in competitions, right? They're entertainment. But when we're doing simulation for learning, you know, think about what you're able to communicate, those smaller objectives that are tailored to your learner. All right, and so this is where I use a scenario to talk about complex expectations versus complex scenarios, right? We don't need those complex scenarios always. We can have complex expectations for each of our learners and use the same scenario. So using the same scenario, right, we have our rookie member. I talked a lot about that the scenario is complex for that rookie learner, just based on the fact that they're new to it. And so in the scenario, if you notice, there's actually an uneven number of firefighters on this line. The rookie is an extra firefighter. 
He doesn't, uh, he or she doesn't need to be there to accomplish this task. Their goal is just to be there, to be watching, to hear the commands, to see how that team moves, to feel the weight of that hose. Uh, those things are like mules. When you turn them on, they will knock you over. And so that's the learning that that learner is going to accomplish. But if you look at this other guy that I've identified with an arrow here, this is his safety, right? This is my advanced learner who is behind him. If he falls over, if she trips, if something goes wrong, that safety member, their job, pull them out, take them to safety, make sure everything you know, doesn't get fouled up. And this is where we can set complex expectations with the same scenario. This is a senior resident and an intern, right? And so the senior resident, responsible for watching the team, know what's going on, doing that job, but also responsible for seeing when that intern is struggling, seeing when that intern maybe isn't ready to perform the task, can step in and pull them off. And that is an important you know, learning objective for that more advanced member, right? Because firefighting for them is the easy part. However, you know, leadership, is what they're gonna work on now. And so in our simulations, if we have these complex expectations, we can use the same simulation, even with a diverse group of learners, to get more out of it. And I know I talk a lot about learners and expectations, and this seems like a from an instructor standpoint, but I really wanna make the case that you as the student or the resident, the, the utilizer of the simulation, this is a two-way street you know, speak up when you don't feel that someone has set you up for success or for effective learning. If you're thrown into a simulation and you're drowning, call a pause. Say, all right, I'm thinking this, explain your thought process, get some help. Because doing it correctly and doing it well is better than going through this whole scenario, failing, and then getting a few points thrown at you at the end to improve upon, right? And so use, make sure your time is used effectively. If you're instructing a simulation, make sure that you're accounting and using everyone else's time in the most effective manner so that we can get the most out of our simulations. Because, you know, when everything goes to hell, right? And the building collapses on top of you, you don't, you know, rise to expectations. You fall back to the level of your training. And that's the point in simulation is when you freak out, when everything goes to hell, you want to still be able to say, oh, I remember that day we did chest tubes. The next thing I need to do is cut down to the rib so that I can then go up and over and do this. I have my next step, right? And you can ignore whatever else is going on in that room so that you can get your job done. All right. And. So along those same lines, right? These guys, uh, oh, there we go. Our captain up here, he has a very different expectation as well, right? His job is to communicate that team's movement, to reach under and turn off that valve. The simulation is slightly different for him, right? He's, uh, he or she is not holding that hose, is not working on movement and, being a follower, they're working on being a leader. And so while this is the same simulation, certain aspects of it can be different for each learner. And this is where I really wanna argue for, if you see a learner struggling or doing well, have built in aspects to a simulation to where you can either give a helping hand, a confederate, like a nurse that says, oh, don't you think we should pay attention to that blood pressure when your patient is crashing and no one's noticing? If your learners are doing really well, have something you can throw at them to make it a little more difficult to really, you know, test their metal to see how smoothly they deal with a complication. Say, oh, the admit team uh, can't get back to you right now. There's a code on the floor. Uh, they want you to start the floor management for this patient, you know, let them go a little above and beyond if they're a great team, you know, be able to adapt. All right. So beyond expectations, feedback is the other portion of that. Feedback really matters. Feedback is how 
you as the learner communicate that those objectives were effective for you, that you learned what you were supposed to, and then as the moderators and as the instructors, feedback for them is, it's great to say, oh, you know, let's improve our simulation, what went wrong, what went better, but it's better to have a good debrief that includes, here are our objectives, did you learn them, let's clarify, right? This isn't uh, didactics. If you look at this picture, this is our technical rescue team and we're above that canyon from the earlier photo. And so this is a debrief afterwards, right? This isn't the best time to go through all of our little didactic points, this, that, and the other thing. But this is the time to make sure everyone is on the same page, that they have resources to where they go next, that if they are struggling with one aspect or another from you know, that simulation, that training that day, that they know where to go, who to talk to. Um, make you know, your feedback effective, because I know we all don't have the most time for feedback, right? We're doing this in the evening after our classes, after our rotations, our residency programs are putting this as part of our conference day. You know, we don't we don't have these big Saturday trainings like the fire department is, you know, blessed to have of where they can get all these people out and do a whole day. So we have to be even more conscious of our time of what's important now versus what's important later. And a lot of the time when we do the traditional format of a full simulation start to finish, and then we do the debrief, it's not the most effective because things get missed. You know, I noticed that this individual didn't do this at the very beginning of the training, but I forgot that point by the time we got to the end of the scenario and did the debrief. So I can only talk in generalities in these things that don't necessarily help people. So use your debrief to talk about, you know, the generalities. That's fine. That's really what it's supposed to be there for. Make sure you're all on the same page. And then I want to present a, you know, a strategy for you to tangibly use both as a learner and as if you're ever an instructor or a moderator to use to get those smaller points of learning along the way, those points of correction, right? We don't need, we, we oftentimes think about simulation as, I'm gonna throw you in, we're gonna go start to finish, we're gonna tell you how you did. However, the point of simulation is it's not the real deal. You can pause, you can say, all right, let's take a pause. I noticed this and I wanna correct it right now so that it doesn't get integrated into your learning as a correct action, right? Correct those small things here and there so that you, don't have to talk about them in the debrief because they're not worthy of that large general correction. Not everybody needs to do it, but make sure you're accounting for the details in simulation, right? This is, this is what we get out of simulation. This is about the process, about the steps, about the physical skills that we're performing to get these things done. And so those details, if you let someone do them wrong, or if you, the learner, are just guess instead of asking, you can establish a habit of doing the wrong thing. And you know you, you want your correction to be during your simulation. You don't want your correction to be down the line when something you thought was acceptable becomes you know, something you got yelled at or you know, really what we don't want is something it, to be an adverse event for a patient or something like that, right? It's uh, simulation at the end, it's all about the patient. We want to make our care more effective and safer. And so right here, uh, hopefully you can all see the screen circle well enough, literally points of correction. Point out in simulation when there needs to be a little correction, ask for correction, ask for clarification. And this is a benefit to us at all levels, whether you're the team learning, whether you're the patient, whether you're moderating, you know, participate really, have situational awareness and observe everything that's going on. If you know something's wrong, make sure that you, you communicate that. Don't be the only one in the room that sees a mistake and lets everything keep going. You know, you don't, you, 
we need we need to improve you know how we do this and do this nicely don't don't be mean about it don't cause a big fuss but just make a small thing you know let's say someone put on the leads wrong this is like your fresh ms1 that has never worked in a hospital before you know take a moment you don't even have to stop the simulation you know you as the patient you know oh hey uh, kelly lean down here okay so when you're putting on the leads you know salt pepper smoke over fire and then that way you'll never put your three lead on wrong right so that little correction you didn't interrupt the situation but you allowed that learner to have one more thing in their tool belt to have success later on all right and so this is that larger picture these guys are over that same canyon as earlier and so he's making that point of correction even as we're in the middle of this scenario it's not stopping anything but the people who are holding those ropes above, what they're doing is an edge transition. They're using their bodies to pike out and make sure that that litter can clear the edge of the rock. And so as the patient, he is the most effective feedback tool for that because he's the guy that's getting beaten against the rock if they're doing it wrong, right? And so if, if you're in the position to observe why it's wrong, you're probably in the position to offer a little bit of correction and i really encourage you to do that and so for all of this you know a little summary slide i really believe in having peace when people ask questions so you don't have to remember everything from the talk make it to the level of your learner don't dilute your message don't go for the wild and crazy when you're not competing make the learning the most important thing have complex expectations over complex scenarios and then on your feedback, make sure your objectives hit home. Appropriate debrief. Don't leave five minutes after a 15 minute scenario to debrief. Have an eight minute scenario with eight minute debrief so you can effectively communicate. Um, making sure someone learned what you were trying to learn, teach them, or making sure as well that you have understood what was going on is sometimes more important than having these long prolonged periods of doing. And then as I said, make those points of order, those little points of correction during your, uh, during your simulations. So I'm gonna pause here for just a few minutes for questions if anyone's got them. And then uh, I'll talk about a virtual simulation platform in the last few minutes of my presentation just so everybody can take that back to their facility and have a tool uh, during the time of COVID because I know we're not all getting together and, and holding hands around the mannequin. Hey Dan, I think this is super great and helpful. I was wondering if you had any um, specific resources you might recommend for people who maybe want to start a sim program at their school or just a starting point for anybody that way they can integrate um, these great points that you've brought up for sure uh, so student initiative medical simulation sims the national organization which was started here in texas uh, i did want to mention that, that texas schools are have been and are still pretty much the leader in simulation, and so good on us. Um, they, on their website, so the, I think, I believe it's joinsims.com, they have an Apple book that is a Sims primer. And so it'll walk you through those beginning steps. But you can also, uh, of course, reach out to me. You can find my contact on the TCEP page. And then for TCEP, I am uh, still producing it, and I plan to have it available this coming month, and I'll disseminate it to all of our EMIG reps at the uh, the next conference call, hopefully, of we're gonna have a resource page as well. And it's largely gonna point to these resources and we're gonna have some blogs on how to do that. And so I will share that uh, with the TCEP community as soon as I can. If you're on this call and you're not a uh, member, a student member of TCEP, uh, reach out to Blake if you're interested in that, and we will make sure to email you a personal invitation when we get that released. Anyone else? 
Also, I can't see the chat. So uh, somebody just confirm that there haven't been any questions there for me, please. Jamari just put in the SIM case book um, for everyone Perfect. to take a look at. Thank you, Jamari. Um, and that case book is kind of the step up from the SIMS primer. After you use the primer to kind of establish your program, the case book is a lot of uh, great uh, written cases in a nice ebook format that you can use that have already been reviewed by residents and faculty members, I think through Baylor mostly. And it's a great way to have a list of cases that you can run through with your teams without having to put in the work to establish your own. However, I do encourage you when looking at those cases, think about what you're trying to teach, not just the objectives they have listed at the top, right? And so since that seems like our last question, uh, somebody interrupt if you have something else, I wanna talk just a little bit about virtual simulation. Uh, I've got about nine minutes, which should be plenty. And so for virtual simulation, right, we're not all getting around and holding hands around the mannequin. So a great product that I've found and I've shared with my school at TCOM is this virtual recess room. You can find this at virtualrecessroom.com. This is a photo of their homepage here in the box. Uh, you'll notice at the top right there, there's the getting started, which has nice links about how to use their program. They've got YouTube videos on its use. They have uh, written instructions and a few other things. This is all free open access medical education, which I'm a big fan of. And it is produced by, I believe, people out of Canada at an EM program there is who you can thank for this. And then they also have cases and they've got cases that they've written into this format. And so on that format, we have, uh, it's all Google Slides. There on the right, that is the virtual recess room, right? You've got your patient, you've got your monitors, you've got your, some notes, uh, airway equipment, IVIO, that kind of thing. And you can include a, a photo of a patient right here. They've got a silhouette of a child. This is their general pediatric template, but you can always uh, use a photo of a patient that you you know, pulled offline or something or out of a journal, an example photo to make this virtual simulation feel a little more real. And this is one of our TCOM teams practicing this a couple weeks ago over here. So this is their Zoom window on the left. Um, and it works pretty effectively. There are some hiccups that you kind of have to work through as far as using breakout rooms because you're unable to talk over each other slash have side conversations. Uh, through people such as like your physical exam or your historian and that kind of stuff. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as I show you a demo. Let me switch what I'm sharing here. All right. So this is uh, another virtual recess room, and this is kind of how it works. And so I hope everyone can see my clicker well enough here. We've got our curtain that we can delete out of the way when we come into the room. Uh, this case, for example, has a little bit more flair to it. As I said, this is a burn patient. So they've uh, you know, photoshopped a photo of a burn patient over the top. Uh, after you take off the gown, you can see their uh, photoshopped salami as far as the burns here. Um, I'm not sure whether those are photos of an actual burn patient or not. And then over here, uh, there's, you know, the monitor that you can show to people as they use it. You can delete things. You can have a rhythm strip. You can type in, uh, you know, your vitals over here so that you can have it change. And all of your learners, while they're on their Zoom call or uh, you as a learner, as a team, you'll have this Google Slides open in a second window. And so you'll be able to communicate well to each other, but you'll actually have something to look at, something to interact with something to mimic SIM a little bit better, even though we definitely aren't all getting into the SIM lab as we used to. Uh, and then on this, they have multiple slides here. And so we have medication drawers, you can drag medications, you can drag ET tubes. What I do like about this is it forces people in the simulations to do things that we don't always do as far as, you know, use a specific 
uh, medication or class of medication, think about what size of ET tube they're grabbing. And so when we're all sitting around the computer and it's a little easier and we don't have things to get home to, uh, we can work on those points of learning and those small points of correction that we don't always work on in the big sim lab uh, because we ne don't necessarily have time for it. And so work on you know, using the right size equipment, the right learning to scale blade, the right type, that kind of thing. Um, you can include photos and lab results in here as well. So you can have chest x-rays that you can reveal when your uh, teams order them uh, and your moderators can give you EKGs and you can have your lab values and things. And so the virtual recess room has a lot of these pre-populated cases. I encourage you, if you're gonna use this at your facility to go through, at least edit the cases to make them your own. Some of them are definitely written at a resident level. They're a little complicated. They focus on specifics that I don't think are necessary to uh, force medical students to focus on right now. Uh, you know, one focused on uh, ketamine use in a person who had their endogenous catecholamines depleted. You know, maybe a better thing for medical students to focus on is, is the 90 times we do use ketamine rather than the one time we don't. So um, look at these cases beforehand, uh, but use you can use this format, you can make it your own, you can replace whatever you want in here. Uh, and hopefully this is an effective tool you can bring to all your learners um, at your institution. Does anyone have any questions on this? And again, this is uh, virtualrecessroom.com. Uh, So these are all of their cases that they already have uh, preloaded. And then of course you can just use their basic template to make your own. And so I hope that you all continue to do simulation, even though we're not in person necessarily all the time. And as soon as we get back in person, you know, I encourage you to really add to your learning. Uh, didactics aren't everything. And I know years one and two are important and there's step exams to think about. And I understand the pressures, but hopefully, you know, look at that as one of the benefits of the pass fail in the future. Spend a little more time on sim and a little less time with your pathology book. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time. I hope I've uh, made it worth it for you. All right. If anybody has any questions for Dan, this is the time to ask them. All right. Otherwise, uh, thank you, Dan, for sharing your personal experiences, how they tie into medical sim, and then like the like, resources that everybody can use, especially during like this weird time where we can't get together. Uh, I don't think I'm alone in saying whenever I grow up, I want to be as cool as Dan. So we're gonna go ahead and break for lunch. So go refill, refuel. Sorry, refuel. Grab some more coffee. Make sure to hydrate, and then we're gonna start our evening lunch and learn at 11:50. If y'all want to jump in that at that time. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put up a schedule slide just so y'all know everything that's going on this afternoon too. Angela's the greatest, if anybody had missed us saying that six or seven times today, as well as uh, say, Blake so for, organized. for her work, uh, hard work on, on sending y'all all the emails and things as well. Last thing, if you have some downtime, check out Angela's QR code. I've talked about it in every meeting, but truly the coolest thing ever. You can hold your camera over it and go to the link and it pulls up every single social media account, every single website for all of the programs we'll be hosting later today. I really recommend you take some time and look at it. It's an awesome, awesome resource and I still don't understand how she did it, but it's really cool. So take some time to take a look at that too. And I just wanted to plug, it was Lauren's idea. I just brought it to life, but definitely Lauren started the chain of events. Girl, no, you made it happen.